Welcome back to the Corporate Cowboys podcast as we continue with part five of Stuck. How to win at work by understanding loss. Read to you by yours truly, Alex of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. Powered by Incorporating Associates as always. The authors of Stuck are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. The publisher is Productivity Press 2022. We're continuing with chapter five. What do I do get stuck to? What do I get stuck to? A couple of little quotes at the beginning of every chapter, as have as has become the huge. What am I referring to? What I am referring to. <laughs> what I am referring to is not so much the object use as the use of the object. I'll repeat that one more time. What I am referring to is not so much the object used as the use of the object. That's D.W. Winnicott. When I was a child... I depended on a bottle. Full grown, I've been known to lean on a bottle. For all of my I love lean listeners. <laughs> when I was a child, I depended on a bottle. Full grown, I have been known to lean on a bottle. This is the Avitz brothers in True Sadness, which I would imagine is either a book or some kind of screenplay, a film, maybe. True sadness. Okay. And now we start with the goods. Family-owned businesses create unique relationships with their employees. This is certainly true for... This was certainly true for Elizabeth. She was senior leader in a UK-based publishing house that was owned and operated by the same family for more than 60 years. While the company focused on developing first-rate content for readers, the leadership focused on developing first-rate people and colleagues. Elizabeth developed from a junior copy editor into a, an executive while with the company, and she was planning to continue her career in the industry and with the thriving company. The company was not only family-owned, but it also felt like a family. The relatively small business of 150 employees was collegial and maintained a casual work environment. The family owners were ever present in the activities and operations of the firm. The family's interests were even were even woven into the culture. Yeah, the family's interests were even woven into the culture of the organization. The current president was an avid art collector and he kept much of his collection in the office for the entire company to enjoy. Then, three years ago, the family decided to sell the company. <laughs> Let me guess. And shit went corporate. Elizabeth was stunned. Everyone was stunned. But the timing was right. The market was ripe. And a much larger American publishing house was ready to take over the reins. I mean, I don't know so much about the reins as just the saddle. How about that? I mean, because once you go corporate, you never go back, dog. It, I mean, it's it's difficult. Just a side note. It's difficult to return. Actually, it's difficult for corporate to maintain integrity that was built from a grassroots by smaller businesses, especially once they take over. Corporate just seeks to, to, to maximize revenues at the expense of profits so they'll put they'll put profits over relationships in order to maximize revenues cut costs and cut service so i mean they, they do a lot of sacrificing just to squeeze out an extra penny but um i don't know maybe that's just mainstream corporate maybe it's not so much those corporations that are headed up by corporate cowboys. I mean, they're different. But everybody's different. The owners once again treated the entire company like family. 
they worked with the acquiring company to ensure that all employees would maintain their jobs. Some people decided it was time to move on. Others decided to retire. But by and large, the company stayed intact as the organization transitioned to new ownership. Then the president did one more thing. He offered for each employee to take an object with them. A piece of art from the art collection he had been building and collecting around them. Some of the art was incredibly valuable. Picasso, Rembrandt. And some of it were pieces the president found in West End flea markets with his keen eye for talent. With this range of value and talent on full display, he stood up before it the entire time to say goodbye and thank you. The entire team went from the most senior employee to the most junior employee to select a piece of art. Some chose the high value art and called it a retirement investment. Others took a sentimental piece that hung near their desk. Elizabeth chose a small painting of lilacs by a French artist from the 19th century that she had never heard of until she joined the company. When everyone was done, Elizabeth looked around the room to find 150 people standing with 150 paintings. Some of the paintings were small and some held tightly by their colleagues. Nope. I fucked that up. Some of the paintings were small and held tightly by their colleagues. Some team members were casually leaning on the paintings. And some of her friends chose larger paintings that were leaning on them. Haha, <laughs> haha. Elizabeth was still with the publishing house. Sorry, Elizabeth is still with the publishing house. I guess as of 2022, she's still there. Elizabeth is still with the publishing house. There have been a lot of changes over the last three years. She learned the American buyers kept their word on job security, but they had a different way of doing things. More of her colleagues exited, while others worked incredibly hard to make the new merger a success. On one long night, she was reading over another manuscript by an academic trying to write their first novel. It was a tough read. She looked up from her desk and saw the lilac painting. She smiled. It was good to know some things never change. You know, like that lilac painting. For Elizabeth and the publishing house, artwork was a powerful object that helped people through a difficult transition in the organization. They were likely about to lose many things they liked about their company as it merged with bigger and foreign company with 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 a bigger yeah it's missing a with a bigger and foreign company but the artwork served as a last reminder of their former family owned employer moreover by giving the employees the ability to choose the piece of art the owner was not telling each employee how to feel about this transition he was simply offering them an outlet for their emotions and creating a shared experience of the process of selecting art together we know that objects are an important part of how people get stuck. Remember, we lean on tangible and or intangible objects for support. The process of using objects throughout our life is a little like going across a set of monkey bars. Early in life, we detach from our earliest caretaker and grab that first bar for a new attachment then as we outgrow it or it becomes unnecessary, we move to the next bar. We move from object to object to create new supports throughout our life. We know that people form attachments in the intuitive brain, which is a combination of memories, emotions, and learning. Objects play an important role in the process because they serve as memories, activate emotions, and can support learning. In this way, effective objects can help create stickiness and support someone who is stuck. So yeah, like the next, the next effective object, just a side note, the next effective object effectively creates stickiness by triggering uh, uh, memories, sorry, by, by triggering memory creation, activating those emotions, and thus, you know, lending support to have someone become unstuck from a past object and move forward onto the new. In the chapter, we will explore how do we stick to different objects in our lives? What are the different types of objects that we stick to? How can objects support us when we are stuck? 
and what are the different objects that help us transition to a new future? The first one is what we stick to. Let me take a quick sip. Quick sip of H2O. What we stick to. As we have discussed, attachment behavior begins at birth and carries into adulthood. It is the human need to lean on tangible and intangible objects for support. Therefore, it stands to reason that the form of those objects could change, or sorry, therefore, it stands to reason that the form of those objects would change as we grow. Just like the story of human evolution itself, attachment objects shift from one's caretaker to an attachment to another. I, I, I biffed that one. Hold on. Just like the story of human evolution itself, attachment objects shift from one's caretaker to an attachment to other people, places, and things in our daily life. Early humans were dependent on following the land's production to determine where they lived and for food and nourishment. However, as they gained the ability to grow their own food, they became more capable of building a base location and then moving into other locations to explore opportunities in other geographies. Likewise, as we move beyond our initial attachments, we find an ability to express our attachment behavior in different ways. Attachment behavior starts with an individual, but quickly evolves to groups and organizations. Think of your own developmental experience. Did you ever find yourself trying to explore how you fit in, in quotes, during your teenage years? Did you ever wonder where your group might be? You might have been looking for the next social-emotional connection that would serve your attachment behavior. As John Balby notes, during adolescence and adult life, attachment behavior is commonly directed to groups and organizations other than the family. A school, a college, a work group, a religious group, or a political group can come to constitute an attachment figure and is a straightforward continuation of a more sophisticated form of attachment behavior. That was me pretending to be John Balby. And yeah, it makes sense. As you grow up, your attachment behavior becomes more nuanced. Why? Because the attachments are going to be more sophisticated. You know, some folks are still going to have their own security objects. I have, I think it's been a knife. Honestly, it's been a knife. I've had a knife since like the third grade. And um, I carried that bitch everywhere. Never had to pull it, luckily, right? But, and, and, and this goes counter to the narrative of like, oh, you... You, you feel big and bad when you fucking have it, but you don't see me pulling it on motherfuckers and stabbing them. If anything, if anything, it's been like, it's been like, not a philosopher's stone, but like a, a, a memento mori, kinda. Where knowing that I have it, just, it's just, no, it's just, it's just the, 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 the notion, it's just a reminder that I have options. It's just a reminder that I have options. And whether or not I choose to get dirty, whether or not things get messy, I have the option to pull it out. I've never had to be in a situation in school where I had to do that. And that's good. Why? Because otherwise I, I'd you know caught a case or something. Okay. Continuing. And remember... Attachments are not just to people. In the earliest days of life, children often comfort themselves with physical objects to take the place of the missing caretaker. <laughs> Mine was a knife, so I don't know. Y'all could draw your conclusions any way you want. Me having it just made me conscious of the fact that I have the potential to cause problems. And problems aren't always good. I mean, there are some good problems to have and there are some bad problems. But knowing that I had a knife on me always, it, it, it had me on my best behavior. How about that? I was on my best behavior because I had the knife. I mean, last resort would be to pull it. But I've never had to reach that last resort in school. 
these objects may come to symbolize a relationship, but the attachment is now to the object and not an individual. The same can be true with intangible concepts like ideas that drive behavior, whether it is the loftiest concepts of democracy and freedom or principles of religion or something close to home like a motto or saying. These attachments are equally valuable in serving for attachment behavior. We commonly see four types of objects that represent the tangible and intangible objects our team members lean on at work. Relational, organizational, cultural, and locational. Each type has both tangible and intangible elements, and most people have some attachments within each of these groups. Rarely do people lean on just one of these types of objects. Let's go through them. Relational objects. Attachment behavior starts with the caretaker, so it makes sense that attachment to other people is one of the possible attachments that occurs in the workplace. Over time, our attachment behavior evolves from connection to a single individual in a caretaker capacity to different types of relationships. The core of this concept goes back to our brain development as social beings that seek to collaborate and minimize risk by sharing the workload with others. One of the most common relational objects is the relationship between coworkers. These are strong bonds that can form the core of whether employees decide to stick with an organization. And yeah, that makes sense. If the, if the workplace, if the environment has some chill ass people to work with, if your coworkers are with the shit, I'm going to stick around, man. I'm going to stick around and, you know, I'm trying to see something. In over 30 years of research, Gallup Research has advocated the importance of a single question in employee engagement in the workplace. Do you have a best friend at work? In quotes. The question gets at the heart of relational attachment in the workplace. Gallup consistently finds that people who have a best friend at work are more engaged in their company. More importantly, the research demonstrates that by creating even more personal relationships at work, companies can improve workplace safety, customer satisfaction, and bottom line profits. The strong relationship that we saw for Jenna in the opening story between Jenna and Joshua, in the opening, Jenna and Joshua, go back to uh, part two. If you want to listen to Stuck part two, you'll find Jenna's story. The strong relationship that we saw for Jenna in the opening story is one that bodes well for Jenna's connection to the company over the years. Another type of relational attachment is that of the leaders. Of course, there are different kinds of leaders. There are those leaders who exist in a managerial capacity to provide directive to support. No, no, no. Let, let me start that over because I, I fucked that one up somehow. There are those leaders who exist in a managerial capacity to provide directive support and guidance. And there are those leaders who exist more in an aspirational but distant capacity. The more directive leadership or supervisors can create a certain type of relationship within the workplace, which is an important attachment in the workplace. Gallup's research is instructive here too. In their 80-year review of the Gallup workforce data, Jim Clifton and Jim Harter describe the attachment in their book, It's the Manager. Clifton and Harter note that managers can be the key to successful stickiness within organizations these days, finding that 70% of the variance in employee engagement is tied to the manager and merely 15% of today's workforce feeling engaged at work. With, sorry, with merely, with merely 15% of today's workforce feeling engaged at work. So just, you know, just to summarize that real quick, 70%, 70, 70%, 70 of what a manager does currently influences, hold on, hold on. 70% of what a manager does currently influences, as of 2022, currently influences the fact that 
15% of today's workforce feels engaged at work. You know what that means? It means shit managers, bro. <laughs> That's right. Only 15% of today's workforce feels engaged at work. And most of the variance for employees is tied to their manager. Oh shit. I mean, I just summarized that. No, I just read it. There you go. I just interpreted that for you and now I just read it. This makes sense. The successful manager builds a bridge between the theoretical notions of the large scale company and the real work of each team member. The correct behavior is a natural extension of effective attachment behavior, as Crowell and Trebeau note. Attachment figures in adult life need not be protective figures, but rather they can be seen as fostering the attached individual's own capacity for mastering challenge. Beyond the direct supervisors, there are leaders in both the workplace and beyond the workplace that impact the workplace as attachment figures. Leaders in large bureaucratic organizations can loom larger than life. Employees can often refer to them by their first name as if they were in the hallway, even in large organizations. Figures like Jack Welch at GE, Steve Jobs at Apple, or even Catherine Graham at the Washington Post had this persona whereby the employee base often discussed working for these individuals, working for these individuals, even though the three may not have been their direct supervisors. Uh, honestly, I think that's just riding somebody's dick. You're riding somebody's dick saying, oh, I work for Steve Jobs, even though Steve Jobs is not your direct supervisor. Nah, nah, you're fucking saying that shit because you wish you worked for Steve Jobs, but you will, but <laughs> it satisfies your ego to say you work for Steve Jobs instead of you work at this large ass corporation named Apple where you're just, you know, a peon. You're, you're a fucking peon. You can say the same thing about Google. You can say the same thing about Microsoft. You can say the same thing about, uh, uh, yeah, GE, Pfizer, all of them. Like if you're, if you're at the bottom of the fucking pyramid, why wouldn't you say, you, that you report directly to the top. Oh, I report to fucking Steve Jobs at the top. Why? It's ego. It's ego. And you don't want to get lost. You don't want to get lost in the bureaucracy. So that's why you try to cling on to the largest motherfuckers in that bureaucratic organization. <coughs> Whatever, dog. Whatever. I don't know why I'm getting... I don't know why I got riled up. In these cases, the attachment to the leader is so strong that it sounds like the connection that some have had with leading political leaders. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't become cultish. They just become simps. They become simps riding dick. For example, the oft-told story of the collapsing man at FDR's funeral train who was approached by a neighbor who mistakenly believed the man had a personal connection with the former president. Yeah, like a motherfucker faints. It's like, it's lit. it's literally treating someone like a celebrity it's like pulling up on a celebrity now how about it's a celebrity pulling up and you know there's just a crowd of fans outside and, and they come out and you know they start strutting towards the entrance of whatever venue they're gonna be at they turn around real quick and you know flash one last glance at the at their fans you know do a little wave right and all these fucking fans faint oh my fucking he acknowledged me. They fucking acknowledged my existence, yo. So yeah, that's 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 what it comes to. And you could say, and, and now that fan could say, oh, uh, blankety blank said hi to me, like personally. Get the fuck out of here. The, na <laughs> the neighbor asked the grieving man, did you know the president? And he responded, no, but he knew me. Get the fuck. Okay. I mean... Relax, Alex. Fucking relax. It ain't, even that, it ain't even that crazy. And it can even extend beyond the organizational leader. Imagine working all day at Dairy Queen as a young aspiring business tycoon. While you are, spill while you are spinning delicious dilly bars. I don't think I've ever had a dilly bar. I got to visit DQ one time, man. On the West Coast. I think they're on the West Coast. I don't know if they got them out on the East Coast. While you are spinning delicious dilly bars, you are really thinking about your leader and wondering how you can learn from him to continue to grow your personal wealth. 
your attachment might be to Berkshire Hathaway chairman Warren Buffett that fully owns the ice cream chain and many other businesses. This kind of attachment to leadership is strong and has an impact on how employees show up and stay at work. True, true, just a side note, true, that is true to an extent, to an extent. They got to be capable leaders. They have to be capable leaders, not just middle managers, not just, you know, doggy paddling, not just staying afloat. They, they actually have to be leading the pack for them to be admirable, for them to be held, for them to be held to such high regard, to have such high esteem with their employees. Organizational objects. The next one, the next one. Organizational objects. The organizational realm represents the attachments that individuals make with organizations. Right off top, I'm, I'm picturing sports teams, and I don't even follow sports that hard. I don't even follow sports that heavy. But yeah, sports teams comes to mind. We form different types of attachments with organizations. These can be the relational attachments that are mentioned above, but sometimes they go beyond the relational aspects. Organizational attachments might be to the products of the organization. Product loyalty, yeah. Or perhaps the physical structures of the organization, like the office. Like the physical office, not the show. The physical office. Conversely, organizational attachments might be even less tangible, such as the mission, vision, philosophy, or values of the organization. Fuck yeah, now we're talking. Perhaps even just organizational processes might represent the attachments for some to the organization. When it comes to product, con when it comes to product, product connection, when it comes, I don't know, it seemed like too many consonants just bundled up in, in, in that one phrase, in that one clause. When it comes to product connection, when it comes to product connection, commercial advertising is often helpful in illustrating the attachment that employees might have to products. Brand loyalty, brand loyalty is the word I was looking for, not product loyalty, brand loyalty, because from the brand is where you pull products consistently from and, you know, remain loyal to the brand. Brand loyalty is certainly a form of attachment and it is easy to see how one's own preference for a product might lead to excitement to work for or with a particular organization. In 2010, Procter & Gamble began overtly leveraging this connection with a set of advertisements around the many thank yous that are owed to mothers. It began with the 2010 Olympics and featured professionally made ads that showed how moms helped athletes do all the little things to help them from the start of their journey to the peak of their career. The idea was that P&G products were there alongside moms for the journey and therefore P&G P and, and therefore P&G was the other thing you as the consumer should be thanking. P P and G and mom raised you. That's, that's the campaign. <clears throat> the campaign called Thank You Mom has driven millions in sales for PNG and builds the connection between the customer and PNG products. There is no doubt that this kind of loyalty demonstrated in the ad campaign that exists between customer and product can exist between employee and product too. I thought this paragraph was going to be about employee and product and instead they went customer and product again. I mean, I mean, P&G is hot, but they're essentially leveraging the same relational attachment in order, the, the, the same relational object. They're, they're, <clears throat> they're leveraging the relational relationship, the, the, the relational object between a caretaker and a potential costume, consumer, 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 or customer at, at P&G in order to make their marketing campaign successful in order for it to be a successful marketing campaign. Um, I don't know. That was a weak paragraph. I mean, I, I like the fact that they shoehorned. I don't like the fact they shoehorned it, but I appreciate the fact that they shoehorned in PNG as an example of what can't be done, but I don't think it fit in this paragraph. <clears throat> okay. 
there's a gray box for organizational attachment object, the psychological contract. It's just a, an informational gray box. The psychological contract is a perfect example of an organizational attachment. Do you remember your early school days when you first started talking about government? Perhaps you had a teacher that introduced an experiment like this. Work with three to four of your fellow students. Imagine you can define a new country with a new government. What would the government look like? Dog, if this is middle school or high school, people were talking about free pot and libertarian ideas. I mean, <clears throat> justifiable liber libertarian, I guess. J a justifiable libertarian. You know, logic and, and tact. Logically and tactfully. But uh, that's before we actually graduated middle school and high school and were inculcated with fuckery. We're actually dumbed down from our... Uh, actually had our spark, our genius spark, dumbed down with public education. In this discussion, <laughs> in this discussion, young minds describe how they would, they never, what? How they would never, this is fucked up writing. In this discussion, young minds describe how they would never punish anyone or never make anyone go to bed before they want. Never go to bed? What is this, elementary school? Eventually, they will start to normalize around what they need to form a cohesive society. Rules, law, governance. For many young people in the Western world, this is how we are introduced to the idea of the social contract. It is a powerful mental model that underscores much of Western society, whereby mutually agreed on concepts and ideas lead to laws, administration, and ultimately enforcement that compels behavior. In the organizational world, we have a parallel construct known as the psychological contract. It is a particular mental model focused on a relationship between one individual and either one other individual or an entire organization, either a one-to-one -one relationship or a one-to-many. Like the social contract, it is the unwritten set of rules and expectations that exist between an organization and employee. Just like the governmental example above, there is a formal and enforceable legal contract for employment. This document codifies the work expectations and the payment gained for services. However, the psychological contract covers beliefs, behaviors, and perceptions within the organization. The notable business theorist Chris Argiris, 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 A R G Y R I S, Argiris, first mentioned the term in 1960, and John Cotter conducted his doctoral research on the topic of psychological contracts. Denise Rousseau studied the concept deeply and advanced research around core elements of the psychological contract, including respect, compassion, objectivity, and trust. In recent years, the concept has made an interesting resurgence via Amy Edmondson's work on the role of psychological safety in the workplace as safety becomes an underpinning of the contract. Okay, tell me why... I feel like they're about to conf conflate psychological and physical safety. I.e. safe spaces. <laughs> the core of the psychological contract is that there are some reciprocal... There is, sorry. The core of the psychological contract is that there is some reciprocal understanding between the organization and the individual that goes beyond money. Money. Given that payment for services can be done at many organizations, the psychological contract serves as the core answer to why people do many of the things they do in organizations, put in more hours than they are paid for, recruit their friends to the organization, or advertise their organization via clothing or car decals. The psychological contract is the mechanism for the stickiness that a person feels to the organization. When it is working, they feel supported, 
trusted, and valued. However, an organizational breach of the psychological contract can be damning for an employee who may lose trust and decide the organization is no longer worthy of their work, their support, and their effort. And that's what makes a corporate cowboy. Just like uh, there's a there's a bunch of fucking memes going on nowadays where like uh, some I don't know some dude gets broken up with, and and the memes like how much did it hurt? And the, then then like the next slide this nigga's in the gym pumping iron and he's like it hurt enough and he's fucking yoked out of his mind like oh this is the this is the new villain arc this fool's about to become a villain no dog essentially you grow the fuck up you mature you recognize that not all attachments are permanent not all attachments are forever you recognize that an attachment to an organization that could easily fuck you over easily fuck you over because managing relationships with an organization is hard work it's hard work and and especially if you're dealing with individuals inside of that organization that can hide behind the facade of the corporate veil let's say they're gonna be much more emotionally and psychologically distant and much more prone to breaching that psych that that supposed that alleged psychological contract to a lot of these motherfuckers in corporate social contracts and psychological contracts don't fucking exist it's just going through the motions it's just to them it's 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 a nothing it's it's bridges to be burned i mean sometimes you got to return the favor in spades but we'll get to that later additionally I mean, now we're out. Now we're out of the gray box. That was the gray box. I just wanted to comment on that at the conclusion of the gray box. Additionally, employees can build attachments with the purpose of the organization, even if the product is less tangible. What underlies PNG's campaign is that their product might be packaged, but their purpose is a feeling that runs deeper than packaging. This purpose drives many employees. As Simon Sinek, si Simon Sinek, Simon Sinek, y'all have heard of him. He's on fucking YouTube. As Simon Sinek most notably attests in his book, no notably attests in his book. There you go. I'm, I'm trying to keep in mind that this for, for me is also uh, speech therapy. So I am training myself how to read out loud, how to be a better orator, how to vocalize, how to verbalize, pronounce and enunciate my fucking words. So uh, you'll just have to bear with me. If I go back and I reread a sentence, if I reread a sentence fucking five times, you're just going to have to deal with it. And maybe you find it entertaining. Because I'm entertaining myself, and that's half the battle. The other half is fucking squeezing the trigger. <laughs> As Simon Sinek most notably attests in his book, Start With Why. Purpose drives value for products, movements, and organizations. Leaders who start with why will drive employees to create more value for the company and themselves. The reason is that purpose is a form of attachment that helps bring someone closer to the organization. Whether is stated as a whether that one's fucked up how it's written. Whether it is stated as a mission statement or a vision, these simple statements help form the bond for an employee that their job means more than just producing dollars for Wall Street. For many employees, this attachment is what will drive them to do more and create a greater sense of loyalty in the organization. Sometimes, the attachment at the organizational level is not about the product or the overall purpose of the organization, but about the way the organization conducts business. For some, the process of work matters greatly, and a streamlined or efficient process might be a reason for someone to appreciate one workplace over another. Alternatively, a particular type of process might drive stickiness for an employee. For example, technology developers may prefer either a waterfall approach or an agile approach. Project managers may have their preferred set of tools. 
and process improvement experts might even have their own preferred processes. In all these cases, the approach to work itself might be the driver for keeping someone connected to a particular organization because the employee likes their comfort with how work is done in the organization. The next one, locational objects. The locational area represents the attachments we make to the geographic places in our lives. These may be represented by neighborhoods, communities, towns, counties, or countries. The key is that it is not, sorry, the key is, the key is that it is. <coughs> I fucked that one up. The key is that it is a connection to physical location that is made unique by the people and the culture of the location. Sometimes the distinction can seem somewhat inseparable as the land creates cultural tendencies that are unique to the location. However, the attachment itself is to the land, not the other potential realms. A simple analogy comes from wine tasting and the French concept of terroir. A grape, sorry, the grape is shaped uniquely by the soil. The French concept of terroir. No, it's more like ter terrior. 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 Ter terrior. I think it, it's kind of spelled like terrior. Ter. Ter. Terroir? Terri. Ter. Ter. Terroir. Terroir? Terroir? Terroir. It's T E R R O I R. I know the, the, the two R's are kind of fluid. And then the. O I R, it's oi, teroi, teroi. O O I R, te, teroi, teroi, teroi. Difficult, man. But I mean, shit. I took a couple years of French, and I still struggle. But that's just I don't practice, man. I gotta fucking practice that shit too. I'm practicing Spanish. I gotta, I gotta get back to French, man. <laughs> A simple analogy comes from wine tasting and the French concept of terroir. The grape is shaped uniquely by the soil. In the same way, the attachment of the individual is uniquely affixed to the land. At a community level, one can imagine the stories of individuals that have suffered through natural disasters or troubling economic situations, but refuse to move on from the location because it is all they know, in quotes. At the geopolitical level, this concept plays out in the concept of citizenship. There are some countries in the world for which a connection to the land is sufficient to claim citizenship. The concept called Jusolai, Jusolai, J-U-S space, S-O-L-I, Jusolai, applies to more than 30 countries around the world including most of the Americas and, most notably, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. This concept, known as birthright citizenship, has driven global migration patterns as many people strive to come to North America for the birth of a child to receive citizenship. Jus Soleil is purely connected to the land as the sole measure of someone's right to be a citizen, compared to most countries of the world that follow a combination of jus soleil and hereditary-based concepts like jus sanguine, meaning of the blood, in quotes, in parentheses. Jus sanguine. Jus sanguine. In the workplace, locational attachments can emerge at the organizational level or within the organization. At the organizational level, think of the many manufacturing companies that highlight their connection to the United States with the Made in America emblem on the logo. One such company, WeatherTech, has made it a significant part of their value proposition to customers by noting in nearly every advertisement, proudly made in America, in quotes. Of course, they are appealing to something greater than just a locational attachment, but that is certainly part of the story. The more common effect of locational attachments in the workplace comes within an organization, especially a multi-locational organization. 
As organizations grow, either organically or through acquisition, they often develop locations in different regions of a metropolitan area, state, province, country, or even across multinational lines. Leaders should expect that as this happens, certain locational attachments will emerge from these different offices. These locational attachments may first appear to be local pride and can be a positive thing that creates camaraderie in a given office. However, these locational attachments can also have two negative side effects. First, they can be used as a wedge between the location and other locations, including headquarters in parentheses. Local leaders and teams can start resisting organizational leadership with stories of how things are done around here that can be a challenge to manage. Second, locational attachments can be a precursor to a siloed organization. Locational attachments can have the impact of limiting an individual's willingness to explore and create, create, <clears throat> locational attachments can have the impact of limiting an individual's willingness to explore and create relations with others. This limitation in a global company can lead to suspicion and concern about people from other locations, even within the same company. Pause. Fucking pause. Let me let, let, let me give a little commentary on that. This goes back to that notion that corporations have no flag. Corporations have no allegiance. Corporations are out for money, baby. And so a corporate cowboy at the as an individual, at the individual level, at the micro level needs to conduct themselves in the same manner. They have to up themselves on game, on knowledge, on how to be, how to become an international professional, a professional who operates at an international level. You don't have to move like an organization. You have to know how to move like an organization. If that makes sense. You, you, you don't, because this is why locational attachments can lead to siloed organizations because you might have an office in, I don't know, let's say Europe and an office in, let's say North America, North America, North America and Europe. And now the office in Europe and the office in North America might have different regional goals, different locational goals compared to the organization. Why? Because at the end of the day, those locations also have to abide by uh, local law and national law or state or province law, wherever they're at locationally. So that could lead to a creation of differing interests between locations, even within the same organization. That's a dog eat dog world, man. Even within this, even within organizations, even within corporate. That's why you see niggas getting gunned down and they work on the same team and they're on the same team man because because they don't think past their fucking hood they don't think past their block oh you from oh <laughs> you from you from o street oh i'm from 13th uh, no nah, no nah, i'm not 13th because that's too hot oh you from o street oh i'm from 15th street i'm from, I'm from fifth street or whatever the fuck even though they both run in the same gang they start set tripping they call it on the street they start set tripping even even though they're from the same gang. Why? Because they have different locational interests. It's the stupid, most stupid fucking thing I've ever heard. It's the stupidest shit ever. That's fuckery. Point blank. Fuckery. Instead of, instead of being a professional, a consummate professional, and not sticking all of your attachment eggs in one locational basket, and being a fucking professional for once... Nah, motherfuckers think they gotta toe the line and 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 you know sport the flag. They gotta be flagging and set tripping and shit. Stupid man, fucking retarded, a retarded way of doing business. Not even not even doing business. They ain't doing business. They over here thinking they they're doing something, but really they're just engaging in a whole lot of fuckery. All right, man. Enough of that. What about cultural objects? I think this is the last one. This might be the fourth. 
Cultural attachments can be the most nebulous and the most challenging to address. However, they can be the most important to understand. Cultural attachments can exist at an organizational level or they can transcend they can transcend organizations into societal levels. Like organizational attachments, cultural attachments often come in the form of intangible objects that have some sort of physical representation. These symbols or artifacts represent a deeper idea, such as a religious belief or a political philosophy that has become represented by a physical symbol. Many such global artifacts from religious fr from many such global artifacts from religions, that's icons, statues, jewelry, and governments, that's flags, badges, memorials, embody the concept of cultural artifacts. These cultural objects create deep emotional connections to feelings in us as individuals. The notable cognitive linguist George Lakoff has spent a lifetime looking at the connection between language and our attachments. Lakoff's work reveals how our brain uses conceptual metaphors to contextualize not just a sentence, but an entire situation and even our cultural context. A common example of a situational concept might be a debate, which Lakoff may describe as an extended metaphor of a verbal argument or, in parentheses, in other words, war through language. I mean, that is what a debate is. And war through language is fucking beautiful, dog. In, I mean, that's just me. I'm a nerd. In turn, the common phrases of the language all connect via war-like structures. Win, loss, defense, strategy, outflank, shoot down, counter. Another might be the electoral process, which is conceived of as a race. The candidates run, they are winning, they are ahead, behind, trailing, etc. However, it is a singular vote at a point in time. There is no actual race. <laughs> I don't know what that last sentence was even for. It's almost redundant, but it's a good closing, I guess. It's a, it's a good close to that paragraph. These metaphorical constructs impact not only the language the participants use, but also behavior of the participants. In fact, it might even shift the incentive structures of the individuals. Our debates become more contentious because the winners in war matter. Therefore, the winners in debate must also matter if we are using the language of war. Likewise, the race that is run for electoral success becomes elongated and, in Western democracies for sure, starts to influence policy before the next race has started. Yeah, it's true. If motherfuckers want to stay in office, they start fucking issuing executive orders and passing all kinds of backroom pork barrel as laws. Uh, what I mean by pork barrel is like they're just they're just stuffing laws. They're just stuffing legislation with dumb bullshit to get reelected in their districts in their and by their constituencies. Should I find a book on that? Uh, later, later. It'll more than likely this this may be the last audiobook I read directly on the podcast and we'll just be uploading them to the patreon only the patreon and uh, and the youtube perhaps uh the behavioral the behavioral shift that ensues is an unending electoral season constant campaigning and non-stop fundraising because the race in quotes is never finished and yeah that's true that's fucking true actually Perhaps Lakoff's biggest contribution to cultural objects are the linguistic metaphors around moral politics. And that's in italics, moral politics. Thinking about the metaphors above, Lakoff describes two dominant metaphors that explain the differences in political beliefs between liberals and conservatives in the United States. In a clear attachment construct, Lakoff describes how both sides view the value of governance through a deep mental model or metaphor of the family. Conservatives, he offers, view government 
more like a dominant father who must create rules, systems, and enforcement for the children, the citizens. Liberals, on the other hand, use what Lakoff calls a nurturant parent model that assumes a balance of paternal guidance, mother and father, protecting children from the negative influences of the world. I'm going to go ahead now, just a side note, because the paragraph is over right there. Just a side note. Uh, the author who wrote that paragraph is a fucking liberal because they believe that it's a nurturant parent model. Okay, dog. <laughs> I heard it best. And it was actually through, I think it was a, a meme or somebody. We were just talking shit. Somebody said it. Said conservatives or, I don't know, Republicans or rhinos, whoever the fuck, whoever's on the right, I guess, conservatives want a daddy government and liberals or leftists or dem, democrat, whoever the fuck, whoever's on the left, liberals want a mommy government, pretty much fucking pushover government. And, and that's, I mean, that's just the, the equal and opposite of the daddy government where like the daddy government's got like the boot on your fucking neck telling you what to do. And the mommy government, I don't know, got the got the glove? The glove on your neck? Get it? Rule with an iron fist? The man of iron? Get it? Stalin? No? All right, continuing. Lakoff's metaphorical paradigm is... <laughs> get it? Soviets? Get it? Lakoff's metaphorical paradigm is represented by language and imagery that each political side uses in their speeches, their campaigns, ads, and fundraising. Lakoff argues that these tactics intentionally evoke a connection to the emotions represented by this core and fundamental metaphor, which is perhaps one of the strongest and most foundational cultural attachment objects in American society today. The oft-discussed divisive political culture self-sorted media conglomerates and duopoly of political ideas rests upon this core cultural attachment. In the context of the workplace, the culture is the epire de corps. It's the embodiment of the spirit. The epire de corps. Espirit de corps established by the organization. As we will discuss in chapter 6, attachment concepts become a powerful tool for examining and building a sticky culture within an organization. However, an organization rarely maintains complete control over its culture. Each employee comes to the organization as a member of other societal groups through which they will bring their own cultural understandings and attachments. Within an organization, these other cultural elements, along with locational elements, blend with the culture the organization attempts to establish to create the true organizational culture. Cultural objects have their positives and their negatives. As we have seen in the United States in the early 21st century, many statues and artifacts of the past bring two meanings to people. Cultural objects of attachment often take this characteristic as so many items are left to interpretation. And not just two meanings. I think, never mind. Fucking not just two meanings. I think they're referring to those to statues and artifacts that got broken down during, uh, during the quote-unquote mostly peaceful protests of the early 21st century. The challenge is, but you know, I'm not drawing any conclusions about the politics of the authors, but you know, cold, I mean, they're academics. And, and if this shit is peer reviewed, it's more than likely a, a, a more liberal circle jerk. <laughs> cultural, cultural objects have their positives and negatives. As we have seen in the United States in the early 21st century, many statues and artifacts of the past bring two meanings to people. Cultural objects of attachment often take this characteristic as so many items are left for to interpretation. The challenge for the workplace is to balance these cultural objects in a way that allows those who need these objects to support for ah, 
The challenge for the workplace is to balance these cultural objects in a way that allows those who need these objects for support to use them without isolating others. In most cases, the law has stepped in to help organizations manage these challenges around religious or political objects, but there are always some items that enter the workplace that fall into a new area of exploration. Let me guess. They tore down statues and they put up colorful flags. As, uh, oh, sorry. The role of objects when we get stuck. As we discussed in chapter three, objects play an important role in the attachment process. They help soothe young children and help them separate effectively from that initial caregiver. There is always a time when the child must separate from this caregiver. This period can lead, I was gonna say to some, this period can create some anxiety and the child can often find an object to lean on to help them through it. This separation has some important characteristics. One, it is the first time a young child views the caretaker as separate from themselves. Two, it creates a state of confusion for the young child. Three, it is a process for the young child to separate from the caretaker. Likewise, adults have evolved this same logic into an understanding of the transition process. It is no longer about connection to a caregiver, but rather the relationship of the adult to the reality of the world around them. Does the world around them look the way they expected? We often label this process in the organizational world as current state and future state. However, when we define the situation in binary terms of current and future, we miss the important lesson characteristic number three above that there is a process. The process for the young child has three phases to it. Current state, one, so one, current state, two, uh, blank, that's the transition, and three, future state. There are many names for this second state, the blank state, the second state. Kurt Leuven developed his model for how people go through change in 1947. He also described three simple phases. He used the concept for ice for his model of the unfreezing as the first phase, the change as the second phase, and the refreezing as the third phase. From a clinical perspective, this is called the transitional space. The transitional space can activate four important elements of the emotional system we highlighted in chapter two. One, fear can be activated via the anxiety and confusion at the uncertainty ahead, even for adults. Two, seeking can be activated, which can lead to creativity, helping people find art, religion, and scientific breakthroughs. Three, play can be activated, which serves to both engage and soothe someone. And four, care can be activated as a person feels the support of another person. As a result of these factors, as Leuven noted, the transitional space is a place where change can happen. The transitional space is a place of both concern and opportunity. It is an area between two extremes. So the intuitive brain, the limbic system, releases old memories coupled with old emotions and recouples those emotional systems with new memories. But these same memories can just as equally be coupled with negative emotional systems that lead to continued anxiety and resistance. The difference between these two can be whether there is support, sorry, the difference between these two can be whether there is a support. Yeah, that's written, right? I'm fucking up. The difference between these two can be whether there is a support mechanism for the person while they are in the transitional space. The support system can come from an object that helps the person productively engage with the emotions in the transitional space, something that yields creativity, play, and care instead of anxiety. 
Additionally, this object can help engage in the other components of the intuitive brain, like memory and learning, to support overall behavior change. Transitional objects. These kind of objects are called transitional objects. They are a specific type of object designed to help someone move from their current state through the transitional space to a future state. Since we know that people get stuck in their intuitive brain, we know we need to help them become unstuck in the same place. The intuitive brain includes memory, emotion, and learning. In the section above, we talked about how emotions can be hindered during the transitional space. How what, furthermore, we know that when emotions are challenged and someone feels loss from chapter three, go look at a uh, uh, part four, chapter three, they may shut down or retreat from engagement. This can make it difficult for us to guide them through the transitional space to the other side where they will find a future state. Yeah, it is, and it's true. You ever seen somebody freeze up? Like, like, um, it's a good example. I was gonna go, why don't I go directly like in conflict? Somebody freezes up in conflict. It doesn't matter if you try to walk them through it. Like if, if, if somebody freezes up at the side of blood, right? And, uh, and, and you can't get them to move. They just fucking freeze up. The only option you really have left is to drag them out yourself. I mean, you can't leave them behind. What are you going to do? Fucking leave them behind? I mean, you could leave them behind. But, I mean, if they're a part of your team and, and they freeze up in a time when you need them to be moving, when you're reliant on them to be operating effectively in in a mission, right? You got to fucking see it through. You have to smack some sense into them. You have to, you know, drag them by, by the back strap and, and get them moving in the right direction. At least get them started. What they need is a nudge. What they need is a push. If they freeze up, what they need is to be unstuck. And that, you know, that comes back to you as a leader. As a leader, you need your leaders to be leading. You can't have them be stuck. We're developing leaders out here. You're a professional, developing professionals. You're a professional, interacting and engaging with professionals in order to be better and to make better, to do better. This is where we employ a transitional object. An effective transitional object helps someone with the feelings of loss and either supports the anxiety that could potentially turn negative or counteracts that potential anxiety by positively engaging the other emotions around creativity, play, or care. For creativity, the transitional object can be something as simple as a pad to draw on and allow the mind to wander. For play, it could be a simple game that helps the team member learn about the new change. For care, it might be another team member taking an interest in a struggling team member as an effective support mechanism. We know from our study of the brain that the emotional side is only one third of the battle. What is powerful for an effective transitional object is that it can provide the emotional support and support learning at the same time. An effective transitional object can help support the individual in the behavior that needs to change. For example, if an individual needs to remember to enter their work time on a regular basis, a transitional object might be a simple and entertaining sticker that goes in a strategic place in their home or office to remind them to enter their time. If a team is anxious about losing a trusted leader, a transitional object might, might be, it's missing B, might be some sort of stress toy that helps them to relieve their stress while thinking about that loss rather than bringing in a new person that might take some time to become a trusted support mechanism. Over the <laughs> I like I like how they dehumanize the trusted leader with just a stress toy. <laughs> Yo, I sound that sounds like some corporate shit. That sounds like some shit corporate would do. Some fucked up shit that piece of shit corporate would do. But a corporate cowboy? Nah, man. We don't need a toy. We already got toys, nigga. We got fucking guns and knives. 
Over the years, we have seen a few different types of transitional objects used in different organizations with varying degrees of success. There are a few final characteristics that create strong transitional objects to help people get unstuck. Finally, so sorry, no, not finally, first actually. There are a few final characteristics that create strong transitional objects to help people get unstuck. First, they should provide the right kind of emotional support to a person. Second, they should support someone's learning when the change requires a new behavior. Third, there should be a lasting connection to the cultural values of the organization. Fourth, there should be some connection to the change that the person might be going through, e.g. the transition from the current state to the future state. Fifth, when possible, there should be some sort of personal value in the object. This last one is always the hardest to quantify because we never quite know what will resonate with each person, but the goal is to connect many people. But the goal is to connect with many people. Uh, yeah, what, what are we looking at? Quantifying, quantifying the value of the object? Quantifying the strength of the possible connection creation? The easiest way to think about it might be to think about the connection to different attachment styles. Okay, touche, touche. In table 5.1, the objects can provide different levels of support through a transition to different types of people. It is probably obvious, but in a large organization, no one object will work for the entire enterprise. A mix of objects will be necessary to get the entire organization to move from a current state to a future state. For many, the strategic alignment of a change to the organization for many, the strategic alignment of a change to the overall sustainment of the organization, the mission, would be enough. However, others need a connection to a path forward, even if all the answers are not yet known. For these individuals, the change process itself, with its detailed plan of what is to come ahead, becomes the transitional object. Still others find comfort in a feeling of what the future may hold, with either the comfort, excitement, or even a vision of what is to come. These folks may say, I need to see it to make it real. For this group, of sen for this group the sensory experience matters, and it is a critical transitional object to help them through the transitional space. Gamific gamification? gamification is a special version of sensory experience. As, as it has, <clears throat> I think something's in my mind. I think something intruded into my mind. I'm fucking up more. Gamification is a special version of sensory experience as it has immense power to both provide a version of the future that employees can see and control while simultaneously training them in new behavior. When this type of sensory experience is combined with the competitive spirit of games, gamified learning takes on a new role in the transitional space. It has a unique power to hit the intuitive brain with memory formation, emotional elements, and learning at the same time. It also provides a positive reinforcement via bragging rights and sometimes even physical rewards that can make gamification a powerful tool in change management. Still others can be guided by trusted leaders who serve as the transitional objects for safe passage from the current states to the future. We will say much more about the unique role of both formal and informal leaders in chapter eight, but the role of transitional objects is one that every person in an organization can play. Lastly, some appreciate physical objects for support during transitions. Large organizations often invest in branding materials during large-scale transformations. Sometimes these giveaways or tchotchkes are trendy or cheap, but there is missed opportunity for intentionality. With a representative giveaway that supports the behavior sought via the transformation, 
the organization can reinforce new behavior. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I've seen that. Y'all you, you, ever seen uh, some restructuring or or when an organization is going through a, a rebranding even, like they, they change the company name or, or, uh, or uh, there's been like a change in management even, they will run off a couple more pieces of swag like you know, like a like a little catalog of swag, and start pitching swag for for the, for the sake of the new image of the company to push to push the change of the company. This company is headed in a new direction, and you know it's still the same old bullshit or whatever. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's for the better. Sometimes it's not so much. Table five point one. Let me describe it to you real quick. The title of the table is transitional objects. The top row has categories starting from the left they go object types then the second is examples the third is emotional benefits the fourth is learning benefits the fifth is organizational value the sixth is change value and lastly personal value so if you want to create your own little matrix you can follow along with the with the categories that i'm giving you and where they're listed so that was the top row the top row Object types, examples, emotional benefit, learning benefit, organizational value, change value, personal value. Now, the left column, the column all the way on the, on the left, also has its own categories. And it starts at the top with mission. Then process slash approach. Then sensory experience. Then gamification. Then people. And lastly, physical symbols. So when the object type is a mission, we're going to start at the top. When the object type is a mission, good examples are a mission statement, a strategic plan, a purpose statement, core values, and the emotional benefits are the seeking for the, for the limbic system, for the intuitive brain. It's the seeking component. Learning benefit, not likely, it says. It says not likely. Organizational benefit, yes. Change value, yes. Personal value, secure and preoccupied. So it, it, uh, it values more secure people and, and preoccupied people. If the object type is the process or an approach, a business process, a business approach, examples would be uh, agile, D Mike, which was D M A I C, Lamarche, P M P, Pro Psy. Those are just examples of processes and approaches. The emotional benefit, it'll emotionally benefit uh, the seeking and the fear components. A learning benefit, it's possible, it says. Organizational value, maybe, it says. Change value, maybe, it says. And personal value for the secure and for the dismissive. Because those can be pretty. Uh, pretty uh autonomous at times the secure and the dismissives if you recall if you recall this is from uh stuck parts four i believe i think that was chapter three go back to chapter three that I, I believe that's the audiobook part four if the object type is a sensory experience examples of this would be like the office scent music or a song maybe a video or visuals the emotional benefit, the emotional benefit from it would be the seeking, the fear, the the care, and the play components. So all four would be hit. And as far as the learning benefit from it, it's possible and or it's likely. Uh, the organizational value would be a maybe, change value maybe, personal value is uh, for the secure, the dismissive, the preoccupied, and the anxious. So all four of those uh, personal. Um, characteristic types would be satisfied in a sense if if deployed properly. Gamification. Gamification. If the object type is gamification, examples of this would be a wearable device, uh, data apps, games, war gaming sessions, and or video games. War gaming sessions. Hmm. Think tanks. Emotional benefits would be for the seeking, the fear, the care, and the play. So all four components would be touched. 
and it's highly likely to provide learning benefits. As far as organizational values, yes, it would be an organizational value. Providing change value, uh, yes. And then personal value, it would be for the secure, the dismissive, and the preoccupied. Apparently not the anxious. Maybe uh, gamification just just pumps too much anxiety into a person. I don't know. If the object type, the attachment object, the transitional object, I'm sorry. If the transitional object is people, examples of this would be charismatic executives, new leaders, designated representatives, change agents, and town hall sessions. I don't know why they put town hall sessions there. Um, I think that could have been, that could have gone under, uh, no, I guess, I guess town hall sessions, but they make it sound like it's a whole organization and not just the person who's facilitating or hosting the town hall. Um, emotional benefits for the seeking, the fear, and the care components of the intuitive brain. As far as a learning benefit, it is highly likely. As far as providing an organizational value, yes. Change value, yes. A personal value for the secure and the preoccupied individuals. Now, if your transitional object type is the last one, the physical symbols, examples of this would be offices, awards, cultural artifacts, displays, and tchotchkes or swag, just fucking company swag. Emotional benefits for this would be for the seeking, the fear, and the play. And learning benefit to this would is possible slash likely. And the organizational value, yes, there would be some organizational value as well as some change value because, I mean, it's a, it's a decent transitional object. But, I mean, the way they say tchotchkes just makes it sound cheap as fuck. I mean, there's some swag out there that's pretty fucking dope. But tchotchkes... I don't know, man. Like, again, this is this is coming from an elite academic uh, writer. Uh, the, I mean, the author. It's not me. I'm not elite academic. This is coming from the elite academic writers, where to them, tchotchkes is probably something fucking cheap, like a like a, a, a keychain, <laughs> a keychain and a fucking coaster, uh, a drink coaster or some shit. <clears throat> so, yes, there is some organizational value. There is some change value. As far as personal value, there is. For the dismissive, the preoccupied, and the anxious. Not so much for the stable. And then I, I would imagine that the stable really doesn't give a shit about the swag. So now we got another one of these little gray boxes. And it's going to give us some, uh, some detail on transitional objects. Maybe an example. A sample of transitional objects. Stones that float values. Hmm. Sounds deep. In 1914, Edwin Booz started what would become the first management consulting company in the world called the Business Research Service. The company would evolve into Booz Allen Hamilton, which is now over a century old and has more than 27,000 employees around the world. At the company's centennial, the modern leadership wanted to redesign the corporate values to create a strong foundation for the second century. Through a series of dedicated workshops involving more than 150 participants across all levels of the company and outreach interviews to every location, team, and role in the firm, the company established a new purpose statement, empower people to change the world. That's their purpose statement, empower people to change the world. The statement was accompanied by five values and accompanying statements to clarify how team members would demonstrate each of the values. As corporate values go, Booz Allen's value, Booz Allen's value, are you, what? As corporate values go, Booz Allen's value are, that one's worded, that one was written wrong. As corporate values go, Booz Allen's are unique for their boldness. How about that? Skip the extra value. Are unique for their boldness. The first, these are bullet points. Point, unflinching courage. Point, passionate service. Point, champion's heart. Point, collective ingenuity. And point, ferocious integrity. The previous values have been around for decades. They were 10 single words that were the kinds of language 
that had become generic in corporate cultures. The leadership team for the transformation needed a rollout strategy as bold as the new values. The new values were etched into a set of polished stones and given to the senior partners of the firm. However, they were not to keep the stones. They were to give away the stones to the members of their leadership team that demonstrated the values. The leaders held meetings with their team, talked about the values, what each meant to them, and then gave a stone to a person who demonstrated that value. In this way, each level of the organization rolled out the new values, not through instruction, but by demonstration. The purpose created, sorry, the process, the process created three transitional objects at the same time. Imagine you are a middle manager in the company hearing the presentation from your trusted leader. You hear your leader describing the value in detail. Transitional object number one. In quotes, my leader is telling me to behave like that. Then your leader takes a physical object, a nice one at that, and gives it to your, to your colleague. It's a fucking rock. It's an engraved rock, but I get it. It's got, it's got some sentimental value. Then your leader takes a physical object, a nice one at that, and gives it to your colleague. That's transitional object number two. In quotes, I want that. And now you have a peer who was seen as the personification of the abstract concept of a value. That's transitional object number three. I want to be like them. In quotes. The process creates triple reinforcement of the behavior. Triple reinforcement for the behavior. Sorry. And did it work? Six months after the rollout, 83% of employees said they could explain Booz Allen's purpose to someone else. In the annual leadership survey that occurred eight months after the rollout, living our purpose and values out loud, in quotes, was ranked as the top component that leaders felt empowered to drive. Over time, the values were supported with other tools like cards and lanyards that went to all employees, but even three years after the rollout, many employees keep the one, two, three, or on rare cases, all five stones they collect on their desk. As one employee put it, stones help keep these alive. Yeah, bro, this is fucking gold stars. This is, they're just ultra gold stars. Oh shit, you got a gold star, bruh? You got an MVP, bruh? Most valuable employee, bruh? Okay. I see it, I see it, and to a point, I would like to emulate, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna be riding dick either and kissing ass. <laughs> Fucking corporate cowboy, baby. You either recognize or you don't, but obviously I'm not gonna be a, 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 a dick about it. I'm not gonna be an asshole about it. I put in the work sufficient to carry the team. Should I need? Should I need? Why? Because that means I could do it on my own, but I want the team around me in order to better distribute responsibility, in order to better distribute success and achievement. Because if we all achieve together, it's going to be more than I can achieve just by myself. So keep uh, keep corporate cowboys around you. Keep, corporate, keep a corporate cowboy on your team, at least one or two, and you'll always have some around you. As you read this chapter, it might be deceptive to think, I can just control people with objects. <laughs> you cannot. First, remember that adults use all kinds of objects for support, and team members in your organization likely have healthy and effective attachments established within your organization to objects that you may need to change one day. So, it is important to remember that today's favorite object may become tomorrow's object of change. As you try to leverage transitional objects, be wary of dependency on many objects in organizations, as this dependence can lead to an unhealthy attachment for anyone. Second, a transitional object, al a transitional object alone will not help you get someone unstuck. The object must go together with many things to be discussed in chapter eight in parentheses but most importantly, a supportive environment. For the transitional object to support someone in the transitional space, 
The person must first be brought into the transitional space in a supportive way. This takes an effective awareness of what is happening and why, as well as an effective appreciation of the person's position within the organization. In short, the organization must show mutual respect for the employee before asking the employee to buy in to the transitional process. This kind of respect comes from a strong relationship between an employee and a leader, which is where we are going next on our journey. Practice exercises. These are gray boxes. In the gray box, the first one is to reflect the first transitional object. Do you remember an early transitional object? What was it? Was it a person, an item, a stuffed animal, a blanket, a gun? Did you hear stories about your first transitional object? Was it a pacifier, a stuffed animal, a knife, or another person? Do you think back on your early youth? Do you tend to remember, when you think back on your early youth, do you tend to remember certain people, places, things? It can be helpful to understand how we first transition to and from situations to think about how we may transition in the workplace. The next exercise, observe. Attachment objects inventory. You want to inventory your attachment objects. In this chapter, we explored four types of attachment objects. Relational, R. Organizational, O. Locational, L. And cultural, C. It's time to take stock of some of your attachment objects. As you go through a typical day at work, what are the items that make you feel comforted? What helps you feel like you have control when things get difficult? When you get bad news or a difficult email, what do you turn to? There's a table. There's, there's a table. It's table 5.2. And uh, it's asking for attachment objects. It's, it's title is attachment objects inventory. The top row has uh, some, I mean, it has columns. The first column is labeled situation. The second column is labeled object. And then the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth column are just R-L-O-C for relational, organizational, locational, cultural. So it says here, make, it's a table 5.2, sorry. Make a little chart like table 5.2 above and track yourself. You will be identifying how the attachment objects support you through your attachment response. Where do you lean? More relational? More locational? More cultural? What do you think this tells you about yourself? When you think about your peers in the organization, what do you think their chart looks like? What objects do they lean on for support? The next exercise is to apply. You want to create a transitional space. The most effective way to break an attachment to an object is to bring someone into a transitional space where they can experiment with the idea of letting go of the object. The transitional space is when the current state and the future state are both known, but the future state is not yet accepted. One of the characteristics of the transitional space is a propensity for playfulness and creativity. As a result, sensory experiences and creative experiences can be quite helpful in creating a transitional space. By sensory experiences, we mean those things that require senses that are the normal thinking part of your brain. That's uh, bullets here. Point listening. That's music, podcast, TED Talks. There's smelling. There's flowers, gardens, herbs, cooking, essential oils. There's tasting, like coffee, tea, food. There's seeing, like art, TV, visuals. There is physical, like walking, exercising, meditation, a shower, a fan in your face. And by creative experience, we mean, and these are all bullet points too, we mean cooking, painting, building, cleaning slash organizing, and for some, no judgment, it says here in parentheses, another bullet, decorating, and the last one is singing. The point in all of these is to actively think about the change you are facing as you start the exercise and let the activity take you away from your thought process to see if the activity calms you. As it does, it should release you to think about the change in a different way. You have entered the transitional space and the activity 
has become the creative outlet to allow the emotions to regulate and let the other aspects of your brain think out how the change impacts you. Uh, that paragraph right there, I believe, was uh, uh, crudely written. Like, it was a little bumpy to read. <clears throat> but I'm not going to go back to fix it. it. I mean, it's comprehensive enough. It's understandable enough. And then lastly, take it to scale in italics. Take it to scale. You want to take this activity to scale by having a group work through the process of doing a creative task to demonstrate their feelings about a change effort, about a change effort. You can take this activity to scale by having a group work through the process of doing a creative task to demonstrate their feelings about a change effort. It can be simple like collaging via magazine photos about the change, but the act will help get past the attachment reactions into the transitional space. That is the end of chapter five. This concludes, this concludes part six of the podcast audiobook Stuck. How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss, authors Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh, narrated by yours truly, Alex of Corporate Cowboys. The publisher of the book was Productivity Press, published in 2022. If you would like to keep this operation nonprofit, by all means, you can us, visit us online. We're on Instagram. That's the Corporate Cowboys. You know what we look like. We have a, um, we're, we're wearing a, a suit and tie and gloves. Yeah. <laughs> you can visit the Patreon page and subscribe by all means. Send us something, a little something, something on a monthly basis. There are a couple of tiers for you to choose from. And that's the Corporate Cowboys podcast. You can find us just about anywhere podcasts are. That's what? Spotify, um, Apple Podcast, um, Anchor, what else? Podbean, maybe? Anyways, we're out there. We are out there. And if you find the links to shoot us a donation, you want to send us a one-time donation, send us a couple bucks, send us a couple million. By all means, there's a Cash App, there's a Venmo, there's a PayPal.me. Um until the next time, have yourselves a pleasant one and just do work. Keep doing work and be better. <laughs>